I'm super glad to have you on the podcast. Yeah, well, you know, I like to first thank you, Paul, for everything you've done for us manufacturers over the years, and um, you're doing a wonderful job. And you're helping us get better, and that's the main thing. And some of the guests you've had in the show already are not in my league; they're much more advanced. And so I just appreciate <laughs> to be even considered to be on your podcast. Well, I you are an incredibly hum, hum, humble person. Uh, I you have lots to share, lots of wisdom. So I'm really looking forward to to uh, talking with you. So to get started, let's have you share a bit about yourself and the history of MRS with the audience. Okay, I'll start with myself. Um, I guess I'm getting to the older age of the kind of the towards the end of my career, but I still have quite a few years to go. But I started, you know, my personal side of it is, um, you know, I'm, I'm a grandpa. I have two grandkids. I have a lovely wife who I've been married for 33 years. Wow. And um, yeah, it's, we just celebrated that about a week ago and it, it went fast. And I always say every <laughs> beside, behind every good person, there's a better woman behind me. <laughs> so yeah. she keeps me in line. Um, as far as my, my career, um, I got into manufacturing back in, I was in high school. Uh, I was born and raised on a dairy farm. And when I got into eighth grade, we decided to sell the farm and then move to town because I played sports. My sister played sports. And um, my dad was a machinist part time or he was working a second shift and to make kind of make ends meet. And so he started working at this machine shop. It's actually the same building we're in now. And I mm. started just sweeping the floors and cleaning the machines. And that's kind of how I got into this career. Wow. So tell me how, so in the same building that you're in now. So tell us about that. That sounds interesting. Yeah, it's, it is kind of an interesting story, <laughs> it, it, but it started out kind of bad because I was a junior in high school and I started sweeping the floor and, uh, actually one summer there was a guy that was on vacation or sick and they asked me to run a, um, a Lebon McKenna horizontal machine center. And all here's a kid in high school that doesn't have a clue what he's doing. And right. you know, they just, I remember to this day where they, told me to put this part in lock it down and hit the hit that green button yeah and i really i liked it thought it was kind of cool and i just started asking the guy that was kind of working with me how do you how does this what makes this thing move mm -hmm. hold on let me show you well that's when we had the one inch tape and the little dots in there and all the mg codes and oh wow and it was kind of a i kind of just took liked it and i wanted to learn more and and so that my senior year in high school i would come in and sweep the floor, clean the shop and do all that stuff. And then I'd take, he'd, he'd pull me aside and teach me some things. Well, the owner of the company noticed that. And, um, he said, Hey, you want to take this as a career? I'll, I'll, I'll sign you up for school and pay for it. And I wow. thought, well, that's a great honor. And well, <laughs> the sad part was he ended up getting killed in a car accident. Oh no. And, yeah. So that was kind of a bad deal. But on the backside of that, the company was going to go, going to go bankrupt. So it ended up, he ended up passing away. His family took it over and they ended up basically walking in one day and just closing the doors. And, you know, a lot of upset people, shock people, but, um, well, my dad was friends with some of the customers. And at that time they had some pretty expensive material in there. They had some one L and ink and L stuff that they were machining. And they asked mm -hmm. my dad if they could store the material in his garage. Okay. And so my dad, I remember my help my dad load it up in the back of his truck and we took it up and stuck it in his garage. And I just thought that was it. And I went on, graduated from high school, signed up for me. I still signed up for machine tool. Mm -hmm. And then that summer that customer asked if my dad said, or just send it back if he could finish the machine parts. And, <laughs> and he had, this so was your, was your, was your dad also working in this exact shop? Yeah. Or, yep. Okay. He was, yeah. He was that shop. There was like 15 people here working at that time. Oh, wow. Okay. And everybody else kind of went their own ways, you know, and mm -hmm. that's just how it happened. Well, anyways, when they asked my dad to finish his parts, he said, sure, I'll give it a try. And like I said, to this day, I have no idea how he did it. I just remember walking in my garage, had this little salt bench top lathe, indicators every direction, and he made it happen. Well, that's when he realized, well, <laughs> is he going to do this full time? Um, so naturally got into owning starting his own business by you know accident not by planned mm -hmm. and and then one job led to another and that's how amrest was formed and 
at that time, government ownership was kind of a, I mean, government contracts was kind of a big thing. And that's where this work was kind of going is for government contracts. And so mm. that's where the missus came in. Okay. So my dad went to the attorney and, uh, well, what are you going to call your company? And I'm like, I don't know. And he goes, I kind of want to be woman owned, recognized. So he looked at my mom and my mom said, well, I'm a missus. So that's where the MRS comes from. That's, that's. Oh, wow. <laughs> Did not know that. <laughs> yeah. That's it's awesome. Not, I always say it's not for Matt's really smart or Matt's really whatever you can call it. Um, there's been a lot of names for, for it over the years, but it, it really is dedicated for a woman owned company. That's awesome. So that's how we got into it. Um, okay. And, uh, and you kept, so you went to school and then you rejoined or started working there again with your dad's, yep. you know, and, and then at some point moved into that original facility. Kind of. Um, so I went to school, got my degree in machine tool and I kind of helped them on the weekends. And then during that time, that's when I met my wife. So that was in 86. Okay. And like, you know, every other kid, there's nothing in your hometown and, you know, there really wasn't that great of careers, but I wanted to get away from home, you know, just get out my home, help me mature up is what it did. Cause I yeah. wasn't the pleasant kid in school. And, you know, I had some, you know, I wasn't doing things quite right. And mm -hmm. so I moved away for three years, but what happened is I kept coming home on the weekends and working. And I remember the day I got married, my dad came up to me at, and said that, when you get married, you can come back to work for me full time, right? I'm going, oh, I'm happy where I'm living. Well, three months later, um, that was right around Christmas time. I came back and that was in 89. Okay. And so it was just basically me and my dad. And that's another thing about MRS. We had hired a, a gal called Sharon. So they thought it stood for Matt, Roger, and Sharon. Well, again, that wasn't the case. <laughs> so we, um, I joined him full time and it was kind of a scary move. I just got married and, you know, my dad it was just me and my dad. Mm -hmm. and sure and we just kind of kept going from there and we did it for about a year or two and i, I i'm at that time i was 21 and i oh, wow. just asked my i got married young <laughs> that's another mm -hmm. thing that doesn't really happen these too, too much these days and i just asked my dad one day i remember shutting my machine off and i go dad where are we going with mrs and he goes well i'm happy where we're at we're going to stay small and i said you know what dad can i grow it can we try to grow it i want to be you know this is going to be my career this is my future i want to grow it and he just said, okay, let's, let's try it. And oh, so now you got two machinists with no business plan, no business knowledge. You know, we <laughs> basically knew what the checkbook was. Uh -huh. As long as it was, in the, it was in the black, we were good. If it was in the red, well, we must be doing something wrong. And, right. <laughs> which can lead to a whole bunch of more stories. If yeah. Like hear those. So let's fast forward a little bit. Um, what does MRS look like today? What do you specialize in? How many employees? you know, whatever you want to share about, about what you look like today. Well, today we fast forward, we're at, um, 48 employees. Um, okay. we specialize in, you know, the quick turnaround, you know, the more complex jobs with lots of, um, side you know, features on it. You know, I always say 20 or 30 more features on it. That's kind of where we excel at. we have mm -hmm. a lot of five axis equipment. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we're, we're not a high production shop. We, we, for some reason we, you know, once you start doing short run stuff, of, you know, quantities 50 or less is kind of our niche. Yep. When you start running 5,000 parts and running it for like two or three weeks, we're kind of like, we're, we're kind of like shell shocked. <laughs> um, <laughs> sure. Sure. And mostly mills, lathes, a good combination of each. Uh, mostly we're turning. I would say we're, okay. you know, we're, yeah, we're 20, I want to say 22 well, mill turns. Mm -hmm. I know we have our seven um, Mazak intergexes for a five axis stuff, but then supporting that we have, you know, our four axis uh, mill turns for mm -hmm. a, not the full five axis. And then we have three mills or, you know, so we're a little more weaker on the weak mill side, but okay. yep. I used to have like eight mills. Well, once we started getting the five axis, our, those, turned into mills because yeah. we put trunnion, we put trunnions on them and vices. We can take that off and out. We can come a lathe or a mill. Mm -hmm. Plus it's kind of neat how our guys are really creative at doing that. Awesome. And what, uh, what industries do you serve primarily these days? Um, about every, everyone except for, um, automotive and nuclear. 
We mm -hmm. just never really dabbled in that. Mm -hmm. Lately, it's been, you know, a lot of food, fluid power. That's kind of been a, mm -hmm. um, a new one up and coming in the last two years for us. We seem to got really good at it for some reason. Yeah. And that's, that's, but there's a, every industry is a learning curve. Oh, sure. It is. But we're trying to keep it as diverse as we can. And, you know, our biggest industry right now is running about 15%. And okay, and parallel to that, our biggest customer is fifteen percent. Okay, and you know, over the years, I can someday I'm gonna write a book, book Paul called Machine Shop yeah. One Hundred and One: How to Fail and Be Successful. Sure, I did get one industry over seventy percent at one time, and oh wow, it, 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 yeah, it was oil and gas, you know. You had, mm -hmm. So, and did you have a down? Did you go through a downturn and realize that you had to change it, or did you strategically decide to make it less? just to avoid that, uh, that possible outcome. Yeah. That was my learning lesson. Yeah. We're definitely not going to get that big again with one industry or, mm -hmm. or customer. And, right. you know, we, I can tell you lots of stories. There was one week, this was back in the nineties. We had, uh, we lost, I had like five customers and we lost three customers in one week. It's nothing what we did. Oh, wow. But yeah. So if I could, you know, that, what, you know, every time you would go through a, um, I don't know if it's not a tragedy, but a, you know, a downturn or, or mm -hmm. um, you get learned from it and you get better. Mm -hmm. And I, when I, I was one of the things in my peer group, I was in a peer group cause I didn't know anything about business and I had to learn it. So I joined a peer group and they always wanted goals. And I said, well, one of my goals is I want to get through recession. Sure. Everybody kind of looked at me kind of funny. Well, when 07, 08 hit <laughs> perfect time, I had to plan. And, um, mm -hmm. so I didn't have to didn't have to lay anybody off. I didn't have to, you know, close my doors and we survived. It was tough, but we, I had the plan in place. So. Well, that's, I'd love to talk a little bit more about that. So <clears throat> as, uh, so it was you and your dad and Sharon, and then did you just kind of sort of grow organically just over the years, adding another machine, another person or, um, and when did you kind of take over and is your dad still involved in the business at all? Um, no. Um, I'll start with my dad. That's, that's kind of the, that thing I might, you know, me and my dad were best friends and mm. in 2013, he, he passed away. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, no, it's nothing to be sorry about. You know, that's, I don't, it's, it's sad. It was sad. And, you know, that, that's probably the hardest thing for me when I hit because he was given two years. So we had mm -hmm. time to plan. We had time to say goodbye. And I'm, I'm, that is, I'm very thankful for that. It wasn't a sudden death. It wasn't, mm -hmm. But if you go back and then that's another reason why I came back to come work for him is when he was 42 years old, he, he had MRS and he, I think that was 88. He had a massive heart attack and was basically mm -hmm. clinically dead on the table. Oh, wow. Gone. Yeah, I'll get a little teared up. But anyways, mm -hmm. the doctors right about ready to write the death, death certificate. And for some reason he just came alive and, uh, Ooh, he has a great story in that. And I don't know. That's another day, another time, but you know, but felt that God brought him back for a reason. And, mm -hmm. and if you look back at life and look at like now, he, he, and now I know why he brought him back. So, well, you know, it was all these little false alarms, you know, you go to the hospital, you know, you go, you have like, you know, it's going to be a day or two. Well, then it ended up being another two weeks, three weeks. And then, um, finally one day I went to the hospital, I was at a career fair. They called me and told me, Hey, your dad's got like less than a day, 24 hours to live. You better get to the hospital and say goodbye. Wow. So I hopped in the car and drove down there. I get in the hospital room here. He's sitting there eating and cherry eating ice cream. And I'm like, Oh no, here we go again. <laughs> but that, that next day he did pass away. And, um, boy, that was tough. You know, you mm -hmm. can prepare for that, but boy, it was tough. And it, it took me three months to walk into this building. It just boom. And wow. you know, that's why the, the team I have here, we have here working together. They're the ones that pulled it up and they kept the place going. And I, it was tough. And, um, mm -hmm. but it, it wow. bef they did it. So that's why I, you know, I always consider it's everybody's place, not my place. So, yeah, but no, that's, that's... so back in the nineties, it was Matt, Roger and Sharon. And then I started knocking on a few doors and, you know, <laughs> there's a kid, 21, 22 years old, you know, who are you? You're young. Are you mature enough? Can you, you know, I didn't, I couldn't 
get nobody to believe in me. Mm -hmm. well, one day I got somebody to believe in me and, and I picked up some work and what well, the same day, my dad picked up some work. So we're in the garage and we all had, we had was manual at the time. Okay. It was for, forced us into buying a CNC machine and it was just a little three axis knee mill and it was used and, mm -hmm. and that little garage was pretty cramped. So, well, then one day my mom decides that she wants to us out of the house, which I don't blame her. And so she found us a building downtown and we moved down there and that was a big move. And then we knew we had to hire people. So that was a whole different learning process. How do you hire somebody? Where do you go about? But we have a great tech school here in top, um, right up the road from us. And what's was nice about that, we know we have had about 80 to 85 kids going through that tech program back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of nice to, you know, you got, you could actually go through some resumes and applications and kind of pick and choose who you felt was the best one. Not like today. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Fascinating. So, okay. Uh, um, so you've obviously grown to a pretty good size shop. How do you go about doing your sales and marketing? Well, we got a website, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, most of our work is brought to us from word of mouth and you know if you do a good job i always call it the qbs quality value and service if you do a good job um good quality parts you know everybody can produce probably can produce a good quality part on time at a reasonable cost but you, it's what the extra things that you do that that help grow that and mm -hmm. you know we're not perfect we make mistakes and i think that's how what separates different companies and you make a mistake you don't we don't start pointing fingers at each other where your print was wrong. You give us the wrong rev number, your dimensions, none of that. We get, we just, we make the parts, we fix the parts, we send them back, get the things going, get it fixed. Then we ask questions later. So then we sit down and mm -hmm. talk, okay, where did this go wrong? But cause if you sit there for two weeks and nobody wins, everybody gets angry. Sure. And so we just fix it, make it right. And this it's learned by it and move on. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, most other than that, you know, I, I don't I want to bring up the word LinkedIn. I, the social media thing was 01 kind of hit, you know, 2000, and, you know, Y2K hit. Everything was going to be done over the Internet. And I remember a thing called First Index, and it was very successful for us. And I don't know that you could go on there and bid on the jobs, and it really worked well. And I picked up two of my biggest customers we still have today from that. And I mean, that's oh, wow. <laughs> millions of dollars that worked for us. So mm -hmm. I always believe in social media in some form or some way. My dad said, no, don't do that. That's never going to work. You got to, you got to <laughs> knock on the door or make the phone call. Sure. He was kind of old school, but you know, today, you know, I think that, you know, there's, there's some platforms out there um, that you can use. And I, you know, there's exometry and I think there's another one. Them don't work for us no more, but mm -hmm. I've been using LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it just, yeah. And are you on LinkedIn? Are you just featuring parts you've made or talking about, you know, coming through for a customer or what, what is your strategy about uh, sort of the social media side? Um, you know, I just post things, you know, about our kids, the hiring, you know, the apprenticeships, the young kids, um, mm -hmm. articles about myself, you know, my personal, not so much personal, but just, you know, what it's like to live around here. Mm -hmm. I don't really post pictures because that gets to be so sensitive with, with some of our customers. Some right. I can, some I don't, but just, just showing that you care. And I think that's a big thing. You're honest and you're out helping the community. You're out helping schools. You're out helping kids. And, and people reach back that, you know, I think everybody's hungry for skilled help and young talent right now. Mm -hmm. And you, someone sees you doing that. Hey, I want to get in that guy's, I want my parts or I want to be, I want to help that company because they're out helping the community. And it just, it's led to so many things that, I mean, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, you know, I mean, I could, I could go on for hours on how many, you know, stories I have that, that I've met people or somebody knew somebody, right. but without, without it, I would have never met them or connected with them. Yeah. So just getting yourself out there, sharing your story. Yeah, don't, so, yeah, one of the things that I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, one gonna of the say, things. Go, <laughs> Let me go ahead. One of the things that I've seen you really engage with and be, you know, quite um, public about is your your support of uh, cardinal manufacturing. 
right? And your engagement in the community and, and workforce development. Um, so I got to imagine you've gotten quite a bit of exposure from that, and that's been useful for MRS as well. So can you share a little bit about what you're doing with Cardinal and what that program is like? Yeah, Cardinal Cardinal's like really my true passion. And all, that all started in 2000, I mean, Craig kind of 2006. I say 2006, Craig says 2004, but I think it's 06. Down at IMTS in Chicago, and I'll put my little thing out there. That's the Super Bowl of manufacturing, and it's coming up here in two months. You bet. And I met Craig down there. And anyways, I met, I had a friend, and I met him at a baseball game. And anyways, we made connections, and he said, hey, he he actually, Craig was working for him down, and he went to IMTS. And he told me, you got to meet this guy. He's pretty passionate about kids and manufacturing. So I met Craig. Craig gave me the story how he was going to start a job shop up in the high school. And I kind of looked at him and I like, you're going to do what? <laughs> he said, yeah, we're going to start this job shop. We're going to make parts for people on the, you know, that things that you don't want to make, but for kids to learn. And we're going to show them some soft skills. Well, I wasn't two minutes into it. I said, Craig, when you get your job at the tech school or a high school, whatever you're going to go, call me because I'm interested. Mm-hmm. And we made, you know, we, we, I don't, we really didn't have cell phones then. We just gave numbers because cell phones mm-hmm. are just coming around. <clears throat> well, long and behold, you know, three or four months later, he gets, I get a call. He comes over and meets with me. And my dad always had a saying, you know, one hand's forgiven and one hand, one hand's for receiving. Well, that day it was forgiven. <laughs> and the mm-hmm. next thing I know, he gave, he gave Craig a, a CNC lathe and a CNC mill and a saw. And my, I told my dad, me and Craig, my dad, hold on here. We got the cart in front of the horse. And so Craig went over to Labastrom and started it. And, you know, he started calling me and he started calling around and I started meeting his kids and these kids were just like phenomenal. They were so hungry for this attention because I've never been around a school that, you know, you have your tech ed program where you have your tech ed teacher that teaches it mm-hmm. for, you know, one class. Yeah. It's fun. But when Craig would do it, these kids were fired up and eager to learn and they want to be part of a team. And man, mm-hmm. oh man, I just jumped right into that and that ate me, you know, just became my passion. Yeah. And and all in the back of my mind, you know, I'm a businessman. I need employees someday. And I see, I seen a skill gap, uh, training gap, you know, like Titan Gilroy calls it. I'm more Mm -hmm. of a training gap. I seen that. And I said, okay, I'm going to, I got to, you know, help Craig with this. So then we Mm -hmm. actually ended up hiring Craig to come here and work for a couple of weeks. They're going to learn about, you know, learn about MRS and learn about machining and learn about manufacturing and meet the people and got my team on board. And, you know, I still do that today. I ask these tech ed teachers, come on in, I'll pay you for a week. I'll pay you for two weeks. You know, you'll get mm-hmm. professional development out of it. You'll get right. to see what it's like to work here. And that's been a really great tool for us. And now, you know, you got seven schools in the district or seven around you and they know where MRS is. They know where to go. They know. But anyways, yeah. So what Cardinal is, it's, it's a job shop. It's literally my competitor. Mm-hmm. And we are, we have workshops, workshops through the year. And, and you can come and sign up for a day. You can be on site. We kind of teach you how we do it. Mm-hmm. And one of the attendees says, well, aren't you worried about them being your competitor? And me and Dan Conroy, who is a great guy, he's another guy passionate about it. <laughs> we said, well, I guess they are, but uh, we're worried about a bunch of high school kids working two or three hours a day in a machine shop with that has a hundred percent turnover every two years. And then we, we probably got other problems. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. So, so I imagine that must be an amazing, I mean, not only just feeling great about giving back and helping these kids, but it's gotta be a great source of employees for you. Have you hired a ton of students or graduates from that program? Yeah, we we right now we got three full time ones here, and you mm-hmm. know we've hired probably you know I don't know, probably a dozen of them or more over the years. Mm-hmm. You know, the program doesn't just bring you know machinists and welders or whatever. It also brings you know customer service. It brings inspection people, and then also mm-hmm. it teaches kids that they've always got something to fall back on. They always have manufacturing to fall back on. If they go to be electrician or construction or last year we had two chiropractors <laughs> the year before we had two dentists, at least they know what manufacturing is. Right. And then they don't go into a career that 
they go to a four-year college and they go, oh, geez, why did they do that for? That's my number one goal is to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, that's the big thing. But the kids we've, you know, the folks we got working here from Cardinal, we teach soft skills there. That's the next thing we do. We don't really teach Mm -hmm. the hard skill because I can, when they get here, they can learn that. But if they don't have the soft skill, there's no reason to teach them the hard skill because if they're not going to show up and be on time and play nice and Mm -hmm. you're just wasting everybody's time. Yeah. The ones that we got out here are phenomenal. And that's also sprung on to other schools now, you know, and the -hmm. school is growing because here in Wisconsin, we can open a role into the schools. So now they're gaining more kids in the school. You know, that school's a 200 and I think 220 or 230 kids in that school. And, you know, Craig's got 180 of them in the program. (laughs) That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. A small town with two cornfields and the other rolling hills. Uh, right. You got 108, you know, we start them in seventh grade. Craig starts them in seventh grade mm-hmm. and they learn metals. They learn woodworking. You know, we started kind of easy and then they work mm-hmm. their way up into high school. And then the last two years, they have to actually um, apply to get into the program. It ain't a given, mm, you know, because okay. there's so many kids. I mean, there's 40 kids trying to get into a class of 20. Right. You know, what school in America has kids that got to turn away out of a tech ed program? <laughs> you find me one. Yeah. And, so we're, I mean, I always tell people here in Northern Wisconsin right now, we have some hidden talent, amazing talent that, you know, we have work here and we've got great work, but you know, a lot of this aerospace and that's some fancy, hard, complex stuff. And there's nobody, there's talent here that can do it, but mm-hmm. there's just, there's, there's no aerospace companies here. And that, right. I mean, that's my, just one of the things I'm trying to target right now. I just think if we can get some of that work this way, it would be, It'd be surprised at what these people can do. Mm-hmm. Um, do you serve the aerospace industry yourself? Um, we're we're not flight, we're non-flight. We okay. we dabble with the space exploration. You know, we're more of a prototype, short yeah. run. So they get a sure. theory and they want to see a part and test it. That's where we're coming in. We're okay. not yes, like eight, nine, ninety one hundred certified yet. Can we get there? Yeah, we can get there. But you know, I got a lot of other kind of work that we can do, and it's not really a Mm-hmm. You know, we've been audited by an ADS 100 company and, you know, yep. they, 90% there. We just have to make that right. extra 10% sure. commitment. Yeah. Yeah. So. And so tell me about your culture at your shop. I uh, got to believe it's incredible, but uh, yeah. How have you built it? What is it like? You know, I get to ask this question a lot and it doesn't, I don't try to make it too difficult, but one of the best things I do, I shouldn't say I, but. Every morning I get here, I walk around and I talk to everybody. Good, bad, and ugly. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I'm setting myself up, throwing myself in the fire, second shift, mm-hmm. weekend shift, everything. I, I walk around and talk to everybody personally. And, you know, mm-hmm. it, it's so I guess, you know, I have a lot of examples. Um, for example, like the one that's fresh in my mind, I had a guy that had a toothache, a really bad toothache. Mm-hmm. And he went to the dentist and he had infection in his wisdom teeth. And I said, well, are you going to get that fixed? And he goes, well, I can't get it fixed up September. And I said, you're going to live with that for two months? I have nothing I can mm-hmm. do. Well, I tell you what, I said, I'll let me look into it. I'm good friends with a few dentists. I'll see what I can do. Well, I went home that night. I texted my dentist. The next morning, we had him in there. The next day, his tooth was pulled. The infection was gone. Monday morning, he was a new man. Wow. Um, <laughs> do you th- who do you think I had in my office Monday morning? He actually brought his wife and his wife thanked me. But those little things like that become huge. Now he just told his whole family and Mm -hmm. they're all excited about Amherst. He he just recently started working here, I think like, you know, six months ago. So now they're Mm -hmm. all excited. I get the wife's on, you know, the wife is excited about it. You know, if he could come in for two weeks, two months and have a bad tooth, his work performance is going to be bad. He ain't going to be as productive. Well, you know, so that all adds up. But th- like that's the key is just showing people you care. Um, you know, we do the cookouts every month. Lately, they've been every week. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we have a little, <laughs> we have a cooler full of ice cream treats and ices. You yeah. know, as long as they're Italian sliced, they're not the other ones. We're fine. Um, <laughs> and you know, just give people the control. You know, show them you believe in them. And you know, we I'm not the person that if someone makes a mistake to go around and yell at them. Um, well, my first words, what can we learn by it? And how can we pass that on? Mm-hmm. 
people do a good job, pat them on the back. And that's what every day I said, Hey, I, you know, you did a wonderful job. You got these parts done. You made them right. You made them faster than we thought we would. Um, you caught an error. And so just the constant communication is huge. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we have, we have out family outings, we have cookouts, um, we have picnics. I mean, we do everything traditionally, but I think it's boils down to if you did upper management shows that you care, I think everybody else cares. And, Mm -hmm. On the back side of that, I give forty percent of the profit back to them. Oh, and really? That was that was probably one of the most huge, thing, the best things we've ever did here. Is because, um, you know, scraps always an issue, and you know, getting work out the doors is always an issue. Mm -hmm. So if we meet our monthly goals, you know, I'm open book here. I tell them here's our goals, here's where we want to be. They can see the numbers. We have our monthly meeting every month. We pull out the book for fifteen minutes. Everybody gets together. We go over problems, what we're doing, where we're going, mm -hmm. issues we see, our customer sales, our backlog, they know it all. And when I started handing out 40%, I, I know I didn't think it was going to be, our scrap was like, you know, we do a lot of setups. So our scrap's a little higher. Here's, you got three mm -hmm. pieces. Do you, we're about 3%. When I did this 40% thing, we went down to less than one. Um, wow. My output of sales went from, you know, 15 to 20% more out the door than that month. But on the really? back side of it, they're getting more money because, you know, it just motivated them. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, so that's been probably one of the best things I did. And oh, wow. ROA how, is, how, how, how long have you been doing that for? Um, since 2017. So it's been okay. five years now. Okay. And, you know, and how do you administer that? I mean, is it based on hours? Is it based on tenure? Does everyone get an equal share? Well, it's uh, usually it's, it's, we base it really down to three things. It, it's a floating rule change a little bit, but basically, you know, it, it's how many years you've been here, um, how many hours of overtime you put in, because it ain't fair for the guy that's working 40 hours. And then the other guy's working 60, he should get a little more. Mm -hmm. And it's really based on your, you know, performance of a little bit of performance on how you get things done and, you know, how your supervisors and everybody talks and how your motivation is mm -hmm. never really had a problem. Um, mm -hmm. everybody thinks it's fair. I mean, a couple of years, it's been really good and mm -hmm. some years just hasn't been so good. It's sure. It's wow. Good for you. Yeah. We did something like that at our shop. Um, we were open book as well. We'd share all the numbers. Um, and then we did profit sharing and it was based on, um, I think a little simpler formula than you have there, but, uh, but, um, based on both tenure and hours worked, you know? Um, so yeah. It wasn't based on, you know, how much you made as a percentage. So someone that was low paid, but worked a ton of hours could still get a pretty nice, you know, profit sharing check. So, yeah, I think I applaud you for that. That's awesome. And I imagine that also goes to just a great culture and probably a lot of tenure. So do you have, I imagine you have folks stick around quite a long time? Yeah, I mean, you know, we have, and, you know, you know, we probably, you know, we're at the 90, 95%. I really don't monitor that too much um everybody mm -hmm. no one really leaves everybody's just happy and jolly and not every day but like i say everybody's gonna have a bad day sure and if it goes on for more than three days it's i don't talk about it because it's usually somebody heard something wrong it started mm -hmm. out no one ended up being yes or vice versa mm -hmm. and you know mm -hmm. it's that's cleans that right up awesome so you mentioned if you would write a book or something, how to fail, but be successful. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, yeah. So I'm going to call it machine shop one one how to fail, but be successful. And the failures, I have tons of stories of how I, we failed and, you know, mm -hmm. we didn't, you know, I used to buy machines, just go buy it, like buying in a gallon of milk at the store. I didn't have a plan. I didn't mm -hmm. know what cherry was. I just went and did it. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I didn't know banks. I didn't know finances. And I knew none of that. And geez, I, everything I, we did, we should have not even been in business for a year or two. <laughs> <laughs> we should have been, we should have been out, but right. you know, I, it's not what I've done, Paul. I mean, it's just like things I learned from you on your podcast and your little uh, blogs, just little things like that, that you learn from and take it and, and use it. Just don't mm -hmm. one year, not the other. So a lot of people along the way have helped me. And I just like to thank him for that. Um, you know, I always hired Peter Pro smarter than me. And I got a lot of people a lot smarter than me. I mean. Good strategy. And, and 
and I hire off attitude, you know, you don't have to have 10 years ex machining experience, but if you want to come in with a positive attitude, want to learn, want to get better and want to do good for everybody, you know, mm -hmm. that the rest is easy. Um, just believe, believe in people and mm -hmm. get out of the way. <laughs> right. You know, I think some of the best, when I go on vacation, I think more gets out the door than when I'm not here. So <laughs> <laughs> we always joke about that here too. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so <clears throat> you mentioned, obviously you've, you've learned a lot over the years, uh, a lot from other folks. You mentioned going to a peer group. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I kind of, I don't remember exactly how I got hooked up to a peer group, but I just, I think they approached me one day and, and, you know, you meet monthly and you pay a little bit of a fee. And at the time you're like, well, geez, what's, if it's $400 a month, that, that, that ain't going to work. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that was back in 2000 and I just, you know, I went in there and they held you accountable. It was your board of directors. And, you know, you had, a, you had an accountant in there, you had an attorney in there, you would have three <laughs> other business owners in there that, that weren't related to your field. And mm -hmm. you had your 30 minutes of speaking and they'd give you advice and you'd come back and you'd better do it. Mm -hmm. And the guy that ran it would come and visit you and made you accountable. But, you know, over the years, this this accounting and banking relationship came. And that's what my dad did. He did the banking and he did the accounting. And shame on me okay. or him. I, I didn't. And I ran the shop. I held into the customers. That was kind of, that's more of my thing. And my dad right. passed away. That all went away. And all I, mm -hmm. that was on my shoulders. And I'm like, oh, gosh, what did I do? The best thing I did is I hired a part-time CFO. <laughs> um, okay. Phenomenal guy. Phenomenal. And, you know, I don't need someone full-time. I don't need to pay someone hundreds of thousands of dollars sure. to be uh, sitting here, but he's part-time. He's like, mm -hmm. say he's my CFO and he's, he handles seven different other businesses and uh, he does a wonderful job. Mm -hmm. And now I know where the bank, you know, balance income sheet are. I know, you know, I know how to talk to a bank, but you know, he helps mm -hmm. me with all that and, and sets up budgets and all that, you know, I, you know, we got yearly goals financially. We got a three year plan. We got a five year plan. He does that all for me. So it's been wonderful. Wow. So, and does that, um, <clears throat> do those bigger plans sort of trickle down into sort of the more nuts and bolts of the finances, like job costing and things like that? Oh yeah. Cause you know, to drive his data, we got to have solid data into our job costing and mm -hmm. our, you know, our material expenses and, you know, percentages and, and, yeah, that's how he, that's how we throw out our, our, you know, our, you know, we, our monthly goals and our monthly accounting. And I don't right. really look at it too much monthly. I look at it quarterly more or less because you can start to see trends more or less six months out and four months, you know, on that. Um, you can have a bad month and you can, because maybe it got held up in heat treat. You could have a whole hundred, you could have a hundred thousand dollars of material or something held up in heat treat. Well, sure. now you throw that in the next month. Now you got this hundred, two hundred thousand dollar jump or Var variance, decline. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I don't look at it so much monthly. I look at more quarterly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um I'm curious to ask, I know that you're very active in sports. I've seen some of your posts with your cycling and your you I think you're a, you officiate or coach sports. Um is that just because you love it or on the on the on the with with officiating, do you is that another pathway to bring kids into MRS or I'd love to yeah, hear you talk I'll, about that? I'll hit the fishing one first. So um, my son played football and my kids played and they were always short officials. So kind of just naturally got into helping one day. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of enjoyed it. Well, I started doing it and I started talking to these kids and I started talking to these coaches and, and the coaches got the same problems we got today. You know, the kids won't show up and, little leadership skills and and a lot of the high school coaches don't know rules very well so naturally i just said hey coach can i come in and talk to your team for like five minutes and i'll talk to them about some rules and i'll talk to them some about team building skills and mm -hmm. what it's like in the world when you get out of school what you're going to have to do to work with people mm -hmm. well, what coach in the world doesn't want to do that now you can try to go to the school the traditionally way knock on the door get a hold of the superintendent principal guidance counselor it'll be months they won't they don't have time for that mm -hmm. 
come in the back door the next day and talk to the coach. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you got to free, you know, get out of jail pass free, you get in. And, and then we start yeah. talking to kids and you start talking manufacturing and what we build and talk, talking about the helmets, how they're made, the pads, the shoes. And a lot of kids, that's kind of cool. And mm-hmm. so now, hey, what are you doing after school some night? You want to come down and take a tour? You know, and what we do here when people take, like, take, take a tour, we give them a gift box. And in the gift box is the candy bar. There's a t-shirt. And then we have this card and you just scan it and it talks about careers at MRS. And I can send you a link on that and what it's like working at MRS and what we do. And, you know, t-shirt over the years, two things. When you give tours of your business, do two things, give them food and give them a t-shirt. Don't give them hats because they can't wear right. hats in school. But that yeah. t-shirt and food will, I mean, I, I, Talk to kids 20 years ago and the first thing they remember oh, i remember having those hot beefs that day that were wonderful you know so they got that image so that just a little tip food and t-shirts i won't, that's what we tell them about <laughs> the workshop too so that's how i get them in different schools um this year i did something for the first time i haven't done in a long time we had to turn kids away that breaks my heart so oh, wow. right now we took on we normally take on three interns we took on five and I had probably mm-hmm. 10 of them that had still wanted to get in because you just can't have so much inexperienced help here. So sure. I kind of broke my heart a little bit. But, you know, I just tried. I tried to help them find other places to get into that would be good for them. And I did help three of them get into other shops or other manufacturing. So that was good. Wow. Um, so that's that's my sports officiating. That's why I do it. And then now I'm in the college football. Well, what do you <laughs> do the same thing with college? You know, you go mm-hmm. to the coaches and these, that's where I'm starting to have a lot of success because um, a lot of the colleges we go to aren't really manufacturing based and you start, mm-hmm. what are you doing? Well, I'm going to take the liberal arts. No, not, nothing wrong with liberal arts or whatever it is, but you know, hey, you want to come and make 40, 50,000 plus benefits, 80, 90,000, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, what, huh? What did you say? And you start telling what to do and now you got got those kids coming at me so now as far as cycling there's <laughs> there's lots of stories behind that um the reason i do it mostly is to stay fit and then clear my mind um mm-hmm. one of the things i do when i go riding every night i try to come up with three things good bad ugly or just something simple i write it down and at the end of the week i take those usually 20 or 25 things and i compare it to one or two every week and then every month i take all those and take a you know, every month I get a, a tip and that's kind of how I do my goal planning, but it does okay. clear your mind. Yeah. And you'd be surprised at things I write down the things you can come up with. And, and then another thing of it, it's kind of the new golf, you know, you want to go cycling with a customer or you go cycling with somebody and then that person knows somebody and mm-hmm. what's MRS, what do they do? Hey, I got to, you know, that's all that works out well. And it was funny, you know, one day I got my own kits, they're, they're MRS machining kits, they're bright yellow and you, they, you can see me a mile away. And I had this guy ride by me one day, really slow and it was kind of creepy. And I didn't know really what to think and I just kept riding, he came back again and I was on a weekend and I was, and uh, Monday morning I get this call. He goes, hey, I, you remember me? And I was like, geez, yeah, I do. And he worked at a company and I was working for a new company. And he said, you know what? I forgot all about you, Matt, but I seen you ride your bike and I seen that MRS, machi- MRS machining logo on there. And he reminded me to call you. You know, I hear you're really good at turning and, uh-huh. and we got to have some, we got to have some turning work done. And would you be interested? And I said, sure. Well, I'm about $2 million later. <laughs> Are work. you serious? Yeah. And just wow. by having a shirt. So I just kid my bike, my wife about that. I get a new bike off that, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. The best so, carbon fiber. Yeah. That's incredible. So we, wow. Yeah. So really it's a bill. I'm a billboard out, out there, good, bad or mm-hmm. whatever, but yeah. So that's my cycling story. And it's going to put my book someday, you know? So that's the reason I do some of that stuff. You know, I always speak to thinking outside the box in the box or whatever. I just did. We just developed a, a whole new box. You know, we don't do things typically what normal people do. We just go on the fly sometimes. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I want to ask how you, you, you mentioned Mazax. Are you like an all Mazax shop or do you have a mix of different types of machines? Um, nope, we're a hundred percent Mazak. And, oh, really? Okay. And yeah. Just, 
that was one of the things that I kind of started out with. I just, when I picked a machine, I wanted to pick a machine that we're going to stick with and that it's the same. So everybody here is cross-trained. Mm-hmm. I have right now, I have 31 machinists and 85, 90% of them do their own setups, program it right from start to print, you know, print. To, mm-hmm. And I'm very fortunate that way. And well, the reason is because all our controls are the same. The program is the same. And they're, you know, if a machine breaks down, we can take that part and put it in another machine. Um, if something happens, we can, we can put it in another cell. I mean, not quite as fast, but we can get parts done and it's just mm-hmm. consistent. It's easy. Um, everybody's familiar with it. We can, we don't have to have, if, you know, Joe's gone for that week, that machine don't run cause he's the only one that can do it. Now, granted, you know, Mazak's a great machine. Akuma's a great machine. Mori's a great, ma- there's other machines out there that are great, but we just stuck with that. And the reason I stuck with Mazak is they're conversational programming mm-hmm. and we we're short runs, quick turnaround. That was our thing. And we started out, we could, you know, I would literally get a blueprint, make the parts overnight and take them to the customer the next morning. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the well, three things I tell people when they start, they're going to start a business. I, there's three things I do. I tell them, I, first of all, you're going to have to commit 24, seven, 365. You got to answer three. Yes. to all these three financially risk everything. And then tell your yep. family, you're not going to be seeing them. If you right. can't say yes to all three, you're probably not going to be very successful. So, you know, literally I would go up there to the customer, get a part, get a blueprint, come back at night, machine it, get in the car and drive it back to the cities. That was where we were going to Minneapolis. And I literally did that for almost two years, <laughs> but mm-hmm. I'm still here today. So, yeah. And you no, know, I spent time away from my wife. She wasn't happy, but she knew. And yeah, I, you know, I went and bought a CNC machine and me and my dad looked at each other and we, you know, took mortgages in our house and threw it out there. So mm-hmm. I been down that road and but yeah, very, yeah, I can relate. Are we, uh, when we started our shop, I was probably about 22, 23 also knocking on doors, trying to get him to take me seriously. But, uh, but yeah, my partner took out a second mortgage on his house and that's how we bought our, our first machine. So yeah, I definitely agree and ate a lot of ramen those first few years, you know, not making up, <laughs> not, not, not bringing, basically bringing any income in, you know, for the first while. And then maybe 500 bucks a month or some just barely, Thank God for my wife. She supported us financially while we started our shop. So, yeah. So it's, uh, I I always hear, I always say, and I hear people others say, you know, running a machine shop is the hardest job in the world, right? It is so challenging, you know, uh, so many risks, but, uh, it sure is fun. Yeah. It's fun because every day is a new day and it just, it's, it's all exciting because it's, it's not the same thing. It's, it's, you know, that's why I tell people, if you want to come in here and do the same thing over and over and over and just be a number, mm-hmm. uh, we're, we're, this ain't the place for you. If you want to, <laughs> you know, I just call it the days of MRS because it's, it's like, it's like spindles turning chips flying off. Right? As, as a spindle turns, this is the days of MRS, I call it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so, um, I know that you're, I've seen some of the stuff again, I follow you on LinkedIn. I, th- I think you, what you do there is great. Um, you're definitely a, a, a big advocate for women in manufacturing, obviously with the MRS to start with, but uh, how have you continued to do that? Um, you know, it's, you know, this is always the male dominant, but you know, the MRS thing, I, I stuck out, but when I started hiring women, um, I noticed two things and you know, their quality, their parts and their organization, I three things, their organization skills were phenomenal. They always want to be organized and neat. The quality parts always were perfect. You know, they were, they checked for the burrs and, um, I forgot the other, oh, the hair, you know, that's kind of how they, and women always like their hair and their makeup. And I think mm-hmm. that they, that's applied to their parts. Um, multitask, that's the word I'm looking for. Women can do like 20 things at once where if I'm worn too, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm getting all the ADD me comes out and I can't handle it. And, but right. I mean, you can give up, I don't know. So. Um, you know, I have a, one of my cousins who works here and, and I remember she, I heard her, she was working in a retail store and she lost her job. The store closed down. This is in the early nineties and she come to use our fax machine. That's so old this is. And she was faxing her resume and I looked at it and I just crumbled it up and threw it in the garbage. And she goes, well, what are you doing? I said, well, you start tomorrow. And she goes, I don't know anything about manufacturing. And I said, I didn't either one day. So let's, let's start. And she's here today. And you know, she 
we have our material suppliers calling her, asking her questions because she's just she knows the recipes of all the materials. She you can just rattle off a chemical um, tensile strength and she knows it. <laughs> she's phenomenal, Amazing. but yeah, she never went to school. You know, she just learned to pick it up, learned herself, to learn from mistakes and learn from other people just like me. So mm -hmm. very fortunate to have her here. And mm -hmm. and she does a lot of our inside sales stuff. Mm -hmm. Our scheduler, she's a, she's never been a machinist. She went to school for accounting and business and she just, you know, our shipping, we have our women in our shipping. We have women on the floor as machinists. My, my GM's a woman. So, um, but mm -hmm. we need more of them in there, you know, cause everybody just thinks it's a male dominant. It's not. And I just, I push for it and, you know, yeah. What are some of the, what are some of the actual strategies and tactics that you do to make sure that you have a higher percentage of women in your shop than a lot of shops do? Cause I agree. I mean, it's there, there's definitely a big gap, right? There's not nearly enough women coming into manufacturing. And, and I think, and I've, I've heard them say that a lot of times they just don't feel comfortable, you know, coming into a, a shop that's a bunch of men. So yeah. How do you, how do you make your shop inviting and welcoming and make it feel like it's a safe place for them to come work? Um, you know, I think right now we're, we're fortunate because we have a lot of women here. You know, if you were the first, if you're the minnow and inside the fish tank with a bunch of big fish, yeah, it could be overwhelming, mm -hmm. but you know, we don't discriminate here and I, nobody does. I mean, they just, everybody cares for everybody here and it's good, bad. Sometimes, you know, it's, I always tell people living in a small town and everybody knows what color underwear you're wearing every day. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> You know, we just, when you know, we just, I think it's just when people, women come in here, they see other women working here and then they automatically feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, I don't really know who, how, you know, if you, if you hear some of that intimidation, that you just shut it down. You got to just go in there and, and like we do in football, we, we start seeing some kid acting like a goofball. We, we jump right in there and shut it down. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. We just never had a problem with it. They just come in here and they just feel comfortable and we make them feel welcome. And I don't, is I that just, something, just, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I just, I'm just, it's, it's, I'm just amazed how well they work in the field. And they're just, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Some of the best machinists we ever had at our shop were women. So I totally get it. <laughs> um, yeah. is that something that, uh, through Cardinal and, and at the school that they really try to bring a lot of female students into the program and, and kind of recruit them in. Yeah, they, we do that. Um, you know, some years we have a lot and some years we don't, um, you know, like I have, like when Maddie was here and I met her and she was a freshman, she didn't have a clue and she was down in herself and we just kept pushing her up, pushing her up, pushing her up. And now she's kind of like the, she goes over there. That's another thing. I send my employees over there to help the kids once in a while. And when, other girls see how successful Maddie is. Well, then they, they kind of draw an interest And I think last year we had seven kids, six kids, uh, kids or students that were gals. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of two of them are going into manufacturing. So we're excited about that. Mm -hmm. it, it just, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a mix over there now. Um, Cause you know, we're, we're, we're all doing a, I think we're all, all us manufacturers are doing a good job of getting the word out there. This isn't a dirty, grimy, unsuccessful career like everybody thinks mm -hmm. at least around here yeah um so it, we're, we got momentum going in good that's so awesome I think well thanks it's only, it's only yeah it's only gonna grow yeah well thanks for being an advocate for that i think it's really really important um what are the biggest challenges you're facing today well probably like everybody else you know the the um find find people I mean, employees are hard to find. Um, we, material isn't so bad no more. Um, you don't, <laughs> I, I, when, cu when customers order something, I always tell them now it's just a, it's a starting date because there's so many variables. Like five years ago, you could tell someone, hey, it's due in two weeks. You're going to get your parts in two weeks. And, you know, you're, you're relying on so many people and then they have the same problems we have. You know, they can't find employees. They have material shortages. So it's so hard to predict that. So I, that's one of my biggest struggles is I like, kind of like to be, be on time and, you know, but it's so hard. You just have to kind of give just, it is what it is. 
Well, and the, the ploy thing is, I, I just don't know where these people are at. I, I went around here, I asked everybody, I should do a LinkedIn poll. Um, everybody here, I asked the question at one of our meetings, does anybody know anybody sitting at home not working? Nobody can think of anybody. And you go by all these places and it's, they're not hiring, not hiring, not hiring, and but everybody's working. So I don't know where all these people went. Um, just, uh, you know, if, you know, what's, what's the future of the country going to look like? You know, I'm kind of, I don't want to get in the political part of it, but it just, I'm just kind of concerned about it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, it's, it's nothing. It's, it's kind of so much ups and downs. And one day it's this one day it's that where nothing's really predictable anymore. And that's, what's kind of scary in a way. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, manufacturing is going to be fine because you know, and I know Paul that the need for machinists and manufacturing is going up no, the people it is. coming into yeah. it are going out and, and we got to work at this together. I mean, that's one thing that I guess, you know, one guy came to a workshop or or your shop, your guys, he was kind of like, well, you're just taking jobs away from us. And I told him, I says, if you're worried about, like I told you about kids at the school, these are jobs. These are jobs that the kids are doing at the school that we're never going to do and make money. And I said, you got to, we got to stop working against each other here. We got to work together, you know, and if you want to hire this kid from Cardinal or this school, it's, it's work together. It's, it's not about me or it's, it's about us. And I think we're starting to see more of that. You know, I went to, um, I took a vacation to North Dakota, North Dakota, North Carolina, and I'm not my, the girls. I like to go shop and I don't. So right next door is this manufacturing facility. Well, I was going to knock on the door and see if I could talk to them. And it was funny. They, I, they actually let me in the door and gave me a tour. And I, that was my vacation right there alone. I spent two hours and I got to see spindles and chips fly. And, but I got to oh, talk awesome. to them and, and it's in a part of their, they're like, he said they had like 700 machinists in their community and like 700, man, I, that's a lot, but they all work against each other. If someone leaves, they get mad at them. If you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's not going to win the race, buddy. You've got to, you, you just mm -hmm. got to accept it and move on. And, and you, you got to get into the schools. You got to work together as companies and, and not look at it at that part of it. And so, mm -hmm. um, well, hopefully someday, you know, hope I, you know, that's the thing I like to do. I think we just need an advocate like, like that, like, like Harry Mosler here, you know, he look what he's doing, you know, reshoring. Oh yeah. Reshoring. Yep. That, he's doing a wonderful job. We need more people like that out there. And if that has to be me, that's great. I'd love to be that person. I just, right. we just need more of it. So it sounds like, I mean, you, you know, this recent time you had to turn away some interns, but at the same time, you can't find enough more highly skilled folks. Is that right? Yeah, that the high skill part, you know, the experience, yeah. the knowledge, that's not out there. So you have to either do it yourself, train them yourself. And then once you do it, you got to make sure you keep them and retain them, mm -hmm. which we've done a pretty good job at. Um, you know, what do so you, what do you do for training? Do you have some kind of formal program within your company for people to, to train up? Yeah, we do. We have, um, um, the first thing we, you know, I used to hire them and just, throw them in front of the machine and let them have at it. Well, that doesn't work. Especially when you got a $500,000 machine, you know, we, <laughs> we stick them in the quality first place they go in quality. And we got cue cards and then we have them work with inspectors part of the time. And then we give them cue cards and then we give them a print, we give them a part and they have to pass their way through it because you can make parts all day long. Anybody can make parts, but if you can't make good parts, well then that doesn't do no good. So we teach them how to measure the part first. Once they get through that, that's probably a 40 to 80 hour, class that we okay. can develop them and then we throw them in the machine and we have a mentor everybody gets a mentor so and we mentor them for two or three months and some people don't need mentoring and some people need you know need a little extra time just like me i needed a lot you know i need like 30 some years of extra time <laughs> um but and then we just kind of feel out whether they, they really want to excel at they want to do the more complex stuff the more easy stuff and it just naturally find a way in a form and area where they want to go mm -hmm. and then just start. That's how we start with them. And like all these interns, we kind of float them around. We still stuck them all in the quality and then we stuck mm -hmm. them into the work cells. And last year, two of my interns last year, one of them's working out in California um, at Raytheon, got an engineering management job. And the other one oh. got uh, a sales job at a, a cutting tool manufacturer. Mm -hmm very successful people. And I love to have them here. Um, but you know, they're young, they want to go explore the world and hopefully there's, and there's another thing, you know, they get out in the workforce 
And, you know, where do you think they're going to, if they need machine parts, where do you think they're going to go? Mm-hmm. Well, they're naturally, they think they would come back here. Yeah. So that's what people don't understand. Just they're scared to hire an intern. Well, it's only three months and I ain't going to spend that kind of money. Well, <laughs> you'd be surprised what you can get. And like I, like this career fairs, no one, you know, I went to, we went to career, career fairs this, this spring. We went to five of them or three of them. Well, that's mm-hmm. where I got all these interns. Well, you start doing the math, you know, each, if each employee produces $200,000 of revenue per month, not per year, mm-hmm. and you, you potentially get three kids full time, which, so five of those interns, three of the five interns are going to stay here working full time. Mm-hmm. And well, you can do the math, you know, 200,000 mm-hmm. there's, I'm going to get hopefully generate $600,000 of sales mm-hmm. off those three interns. So what right. was my for spending a couple hours at a career fair. Yeah. So do you, I I think I heard you say this once, I can't remember where it was, but you, you know, you've had to turn away millions of dollars worth of work just because you don't have the people to to run the machines, right? Yeah, that was back in um, 2020, right? COVID hit. And Mm -hmm. I had a customer who had um, a product overseas in China and they weren't getting product. And they had to get these particular assemblies out and they had to, <laughs> they had them at shops over there. And, and it was like, I think like the thousands of parts and I couldn't have physically done it, Paul. There's just no way. I mean, I, if I had every machine tied at my shop, I couldn't have made their deadline. Hmm. And it's a shame because I couldn't get material. I couldn't get people. I couldn't get machines. And it was just that whole corrupt thing. And I, I just, I ended up finding them a couple companies to help them out, but it wasn't nearly enough. And they ended up getting themselves in no the trouble and not getting their product out. But hmm. I did the best I could. But just think if I could have had the people here, I could have the equipment here, I could have ramped it up and it could have been a long term. Sure. Just, but I just didn't have the capacity. And and I, it was, yeah, it was, it was a shame that I turned it down. Right. Um, yeah, well, sometimes there's opportunities that come that are just beyond what we're capable of doing. You know, I know we had some like that where we would have had to buy six or eight machines all at once, and it's just too much to bite off. You know. Um, yeah. But uh, but more uh, than it's, fif- it's, yeah, more than fifteen percent growth in one year is a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not manageable. It's yeah. So. Well, I think we're getting close to the end. I wanted to, if you could kind of summarize some of the, you know, if you had to summarize sort of the best decisions you've ever made or the best things that you do that have led to your long-term success and advice that you would give to other shops, maybe earlier in their journey, how would you, uh, how would you describe that? Well, like I said, I think the bet, the bet, my best advice is hire, hire people smarter than you and get out of the way. I think that's been the most successful thing that I've ever done. It took me a while to realize that. Mm-hmm. Um, if someone's starting to shop, you know, focus on those three things. Yeah. And it, it looks like it's hard at first, but just stick. Don't, don't day by day. Mm-hmm. Cause tomorrow may never happen. Don't get all wound up if something about two or three weeks down the road. Just take it day by day, step by step. Start I, we, three things. We say start big. I'll say, Think big, start small, move fast. Um, mm, so I stick like to those three things, you'll be yeah. successful. I like those. Awesome. So if people wanted to reach out to you uh, to learn more about you or talk with you or about MRS, how would how would you suggest they do that? Um, you know, I got LinkedIn. Just type up Matt Goosey. Um, that's G-U-S-E. Or mm-hmm. just Google my name, you know, Matt Goosey. And podcast, you're going to find a whole bunch of podcasts I've been on. Um, but LinkedIn or, you know, look up our website, mrsmachiningco.com and you can reach me through there too. And okay. I'll make sure those are in our, in the show notes. So, okay. Those links. Awesome. Well, Matt, it's been a pleasure and an honor to sit down and chat with you, get to know you a little bit better. Um, I really appreciate you sharing your wisdom. You definitely have lots of it. So you're, and you're a very humble guy, but, uh, you got a lot to share. So I really appreciate you sharing with our audience. Well, thank you. All right. Well, we will. Uh, will I be seeing you at IMTS? Yeah, probably. You see me folding around or somewhere. Okay. I look forward to it. Awesome. Well, thanks again for joining and thanks for, for sharing all your wisdom with us. Have a good rest of your day.